Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome wherever you're joining from. So many of you, and this is so exciting. Uh, I think we, I'm calling from India. So I'm in this, it's already night. It's 9.30 p.m. for me. And for some of you, it's 11 in the morning. So welcome and thank you for joining us uh, this um, evening, afternoon. Uh, my name is Caldwell Manners, and I am the communications coordinator for CPT. And uh, just want to express how excited we are for uh, you being here and sharing the work of the team and the stories from Palestine with you. Um, this film, Light, was created to challenge the prevailing narrative. Too often, the oppressor is the one who always speaks and people around the world sit and forget, and forgetting that the sur survivors did not have the opportunity to speak and share their pain and suffering. This film comes in a time of dire circumstances as Palestinians are currently living through a genocide. Despite the horrifying acts of violence taking place right now, the film draws on the steadfastness of decades um, of Palestinian resistance and a light that refuses to be extinguished. As the narrator in the film explains, what has happened today will be part of my story in the future. 
Maybe one day I will be sitting with grandchildren, telling them my experiences of life under occupation and what life was like then. I will tell them how I, with my community, survived a violent apartheid system. I hope all of you have had the opportunity to watch the film. If not, um, there's still time, obviously. Uh, I hope you've had you've learned something new and you've been challenged and you've been inspired to take action to end the occupation. Today, we're really excited about the premiere and the opportunity for you to meet with the director, Ahmed Abu Monshar, as he shares about his experience of making the film. We're extremely excited that you get to meet the protagonists of the film, Nisreen and Tarek, who will be sharing more about the reality of the occupation, its impact on their lives, and of course, their hopes. And finally, we'll be having a Q&A session towards the end, where you will get a chance to ask questions of the CPT team of Ahmed, of Nisreen, or Tarek. Um, but before we start, I just want to thank each and every one of you for supporting this film, for joining us at this premiere and making the work of solidarity for the liberation of Palestine possible. I'd like to take a few minutes to just introduce you to the producers and sponsors of the film. They helped make this film possible. Uh, our first producer is Movimiento Non Violento. The Italian nonviolent movement was founded by the philosopher and anti-fascist Aldo Capitini as a form of organizing a, a existing pacif pacifist forces since 1961. It aimed to develop and spread the nonviolent method through group work with people in several places who became centers for the promotion of the nonviolent ideal on a local and national level and collectively engage in social action. Movimento Non Violento is the Italian branch of the War Resisters International and member of the European Bureau of Conscientious Objection to Military Service. Currently with the campaign Object War, Movimento Non Violento is committed to empowering and project, projecting the voices of those against the war, especially the conscientious objectors, deserters and draft dodgers in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Israel and Palestine. Their support for the film is linked to their campaign, Object War. Our other producer is Meta Peace Teams. Meta Peace Teams is a recognized 5013C nonprofit organization that has for over 30 years worked to create a nonviolent alternative to militarism through empowered peacemaking. Meta Peace Teams, or MPT, understands that the primary violence in our world is structural and embedded in systems of oppression and domination. MPT seeks a just world grounded in nonviolence and respect for the sacred interconnectedness of all life. They teach people the power of nonviolence, train individuals in vi violence de-escalation skills. MPT also places nonviolence reduction peace teams when invited in war zones and places of conflict where there's a likelihood of violence and offers supportive networking to like-hearted organizations. You can find them at metapeaceteam.org. Our third producer is Pax Christi USA. Pax Christi USA is the National Catholic Peace and Justice Movement. Grounded in the gospel and Catholic social teaching, Pax Christi USA rejects war, preparation for war, every form of violence and domination, and personal and systemic racism. As a section of Pax Christi International, Pax Christi USA are members of the International Catholic Peace and Justice Movement that seeks to model the peace of Christ in their witness to the mandate of the nonviolence of the cross. You can find them at paxchristiusa.org. Our first sponsor is the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. The Presbyterian Peace Fellowship with a 80 year legacy unites peacemakers, clergy, and lay leaders dedicated to justice, rooted in Jesus Christ's nonviolence. They support community-led initiatives embodying God's shalom. From direct action to education, they advocate at all levels from congregational to denominational. Together, they foster love and support across the U.S., promoting peace through outreach, relationships, and actions. Their network fosters mutual support and solidarity 
across the United States seeking peace and liberation. You can find them at peace, presbypeacefellowship.org. The links will be in the chat. And our final sponsor is um, Charles V. Hurst and Maria A. Smith. Uh, they sponsored this film as part of their war tax resistance. They redirected a portion of their U.S. federal taxes away from funding the military and instead donated to peace work, including CPT in Palestine. There are other sponsors and you can find them on cpt.org uh, with information about uh, each, each one of them. Um, so we'll just move into the uh, premiere this evening. And um, I first would like to invite Tartil from the CPT Palestine team to introduce us to the context of the film and help us make connections with the current reality in Gaza and the West Bank. Tartil. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you for being here. And uh, just to introduce myself for people who don't know me, my name is Tartil. I am Palestinian from Habja. And I've been with CBT for five years now. So again, I would like to thank you for being here and trusting us and watching live and being here in this space. I wanted to share with you why we chose to make life. Life really makes us understand the status of Palestinians' life. The stories you heard in the documentary, they are not just individual stories. If we are looking at the collective image we have now, and if we dig deeper on how each of them actually represent wider range of Palestinians. Let's take Nisreen, for example. Nisreen, she is not just a single mother or an artist. She is also a woman who suddenly found herself in a space where she is the only provider for her children. And you, as you may know or not, that in the Palestinian family structure, the male are the one who are responsible to provide for their family. But suddenly, now she is the only provider and her children are deprived from their fathers in a situation where it's already hard for everyone to keep up with their daily life because of the daily Israeli aggression. She had no other choice but to stand up on her feet and start over. Now, let's think of how many Muslims we have all over Palestine. How many men that uh, Israeli killed? How many men were, were kidnapped? How many of them were injured? And now they are no longer are able to provide for their families anymore. Muslims represent thousands of Palestinian women she makes us actually realize that Palestinian women don't have the privilege to, be, to grieve or to break down. They have no other option but to be strong. And that's why you all hear Palestinian women are strong. Because Palestinian women have to be strong. That's the only option that they have. And now, if we go to Torah story, Torah is a third generation refugee that uh, he inherited his refugee life and he inherited the pain, the trauma and the resistance and the hope that they will come back to their land someday. Torah is a person who, uh, with his own community, that they try to make their life, their really hard life, livable. But as every colonizer, they are being reminded every day that they are occupied and they have no right in this land. And uh, this land that they loved, at least, even that they were displaced to it. But they loved and they tried to make it home for them. They wanted to uh, have a normal life still. So both Nisreen and Toria wanted, uh, they teach us the Palestinian tribe 
to have a normal life and hope that they will get their joy. And they teach us how they daily resist. And if we get what we are in right now, that gets us to the question that we always hear now. Why the 7th of October happened? If you want to answer it in a very short way, it happened because Palestinians are daily reminded that they are occupied. They have no rights, no access to clean water, no access to a good education, no, no access to graze their lands and feed their animals daily because the Israeli really are taking more and more lands every day all over Palestine. So as long as there is oppression, the resistance will keep happening because people are longing to be free. And that's what we do in CBK. That's what we believe. We resist in our own way. We educate, we advocate, we share the truth that we see on the ground every day. The word no and the word is actually knowing. The change is happening now. And we are very hopeful about it. So again, I want to thank you for being here. And thank you for being part of this change. Erdil, thank you so much for sharing that with us and reminding us of the role that each that we have for making change. Um, I just want to invite you as we go ahead to think of questions that you might have for Tartil or for Ahmed or for Tarek Nazreen uh, or the CPT team. And uh, towards the end, we'll be having a Q&A session, which we'll try to, if you can enter your questions in the chat. So if you could uh, start off by naming the person for whom the question is. Uh, so you could put Tartil, and then the question, or Ahmed, and then the question, or CPD Palestine, and then the question. And you can enter that in the chat as the as the program goes along or towards the end. Um, next, I'd like to call on um, Ahmed, the director of the film, and he'd like to share with us a little bit about his process in making the film and why he made the film. Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning of this event, I was almost crying. I don't know, seeing you here all, seeing you that you are able and want to support us, want to support the Palestinians and seeing it, it's mean, it's mean a lot to me. And it's really like, it's touched my heart. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your donation. Thank you for uh, helping CBT to continue and helping the team. Uh, to function and still working in Hebron and supporting the communities there. Before I begin, I was, I spent days nervous and thinking what kind of words that I want to use, what kind of things that I can describe, which can summarize the feelings, the stress, the anxiety that we went through when we, we, we made this film. We start with kind of nothing. We don't have much experience. Uh, we were functioning in a military place where a lot of soldiers who see us as a second or a human animal as what they describe. So being trying to film like during the checkpoint, if you have watched the film, seeing the camera and how we were hesitant and afraid to just to bring the camera in order to let you know and see what's happening inside the checkpoint, what's happening inside a place where people are afraid all of the time, not just once a time, it's always, it's a daily, it's a daily time for them. So uh, good evening, good evening everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Lunching Light, Low. A heartful thanks to the dedicated team who believed and believed in me and believed themselves and believe in this project. To the volunteers at CBT Palestine who helped us to write the scenarios, to film and everything. They were part in every process that we were 
making the film. To our financial supporters and everyone who believed in the power of this story. I am Ahmed Abu Munshar, a clinical psychologist. But for the past three years, I have found myself drawn to a different kind of healing. The healing power of storytelling. In Hebron, my city, stories are woven into the fabric of our lives. The echo through the ancient streets carried on the wind, whispering through the olive groves. But those stories are often unheard, overshadowed by the harsh realities of occupation. That's why we made light. No, we believe the story have the power to bridge divides, to foster the empathy, the empathy, and to ignite change. Through the experience of Nisreen, a woman who lost her husband, and Tariq, a young man inspired by his hero uncle, Light offers a glimpse into uh, the lives of Palestinians in Hebron. These are not just individuals, individual stories. They represent the shared struggles of our community, the fear children face on their way to school, the daily indignities influenced by the checkpoints, and the unwavering spirit that keep us going. Once year, one year ago, my friend Amy confided in me that her daughter asked her a question that stayed with me for a long time. Does Palestinian have to have hope? It made me wonder, is hope mandatory in an abnormal situation under a control of a powerful oppressor? What does it hope mean to us? Light is a film that explores these very questions. We start the story with Ibrahimi Mosque Massacre, a dark chapter etched in our city memory. This event, the Israeli apartheid system that continues to control our lives, shapes our daily realities, and unfortunately, our people have endured a countless massacres lately in Gaza. As we reflect in our work, let us remember our heroes and martyrs, Al Hajj Sulaiman Al Haddalin and Hisham Al Azza. May their unwavering courage and sacrifice forever inspiring us. In filming light, we weren't just capturing images, we were forging a human connection. We walked along, alongside students on their perilous journeys, listened to the heart breaks of a family's losing loved ones and shared the quiet moment of a laughter and resilience. The connection are what make light though a powerful film. They allow you, the viewer, you I mean, to step into our shoes, to feel the fear, the hope, and the unwavering determination that defines our lives. Light doesn't shy away from the darkness, but it's also celebrate the light that continues to shine within us. It is the light of mothers fiercely protecting their children, the light of children determining to get an education, the light of a community that refused to be broken. This light is not ours alone. It's a shared light a flickering film that can, that can illuminate the path toward the brightening future for all. Light is more than a documentary. It is my baby. It is an invitation to connect, to understand, and to act. By sharing our stories, we hope to, to build bridges of our empathy and inspire you to join us in advocating for just a future for all Palestinians. Thank you for being here tonight and let the light of these stories guide us forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you for sharing um, your story and your process with us. Uh, in the chat, you'll see that there's a 
link that has just been placed. It's called Beyond the Frame. And it says, uh, Ahmed wrote a little bit about reflected on his process there as well. And you can, you can find that there. Um, all right, so right now we, we have the opportunity to welcome Tariq, who is uh, one of the protagonists in the film. We're really excited to hear from him and uh, I would like to invite Tariq uh, to, to share with us. Hi everyone, and thank you for uh, having me tonight with you. And uh, good evening to everyone. So my name is Targa Hadalin and I'm, it happens that I'm uh, one of the, the main characters in this film, this documentary that expresses the, the stories around my community, around myself. And as my friends here, who I am very grateful for to choose me to participate and join this fabulous work. Uh, as they mentioned, I'm, you know, a third generation refugee, you know, living in this small village in located in South Hebron Hills, Um Al Khair. All of my life since I was born has been, you know, of just living under occupation that doesn't really cares about others' life. So that's why we are suffering the most, not only after October 7th or the war on Gaza, way before. So as I said, I am a third generation refugee and my story of suffering goes back to 1948 when my grandfather was transferred as part of his uh, tribal Jahaleen to, to this area. My grandfather uh, specifically and his cousin came to this village of Malkhair and they start living after being refugees. And later at time, we they succeeded to buy land and live over this land. That's why we don't live in a camp. And where you see in the in the film, the the the, the, the you know the, the view of the community that we live in this small Bedouin happens to be Bedouin community. Uh, and that's why we, we are not living in a camp, but still we are refugees. And we always have the dream to go back as everyone has the right to return. And here we are since 1980, our life had uh, our second, I want to say catastrophe, Nakba started and it's going on. It's not stopped. I mean, for the Palestinians, it's, you know, a continuous Nakba since 1948. And for us, this date matters because the settlements in our region started to exist and be, be built on, on our lands. And this settlement, Carmel, that is was that was built just one meter away from our homes, turned our life to, you know, really upside down. And, you know, every everything has become, you know, very hard for us living over this land. And the situation here, the people are suffering and I bet there is a lot of CBT uh, team. They, they have been to the community and probably heard from me personally or from other community members and they know the situation. But very shortly, the situation with my village, it's about suffering in every different point of our life, in every different part of our life. This community is unrecognized by the occupation authorities that they rule this area as it happens to be Area C, and they deny us from having water or electricity or to fix the roads or to have any kind of infrastructure. The community always has been suffering from home demolitions, and which is a major issue for us because we lost way before and long ago the sense of security and safety within our home, this new home that we created for ourselves. And the community suffered from 16 time demolitions. In addition to the lack of services and the denial of services and the home demolitions, we yet still suffering from the settlers' violence, which nowadays is the major issue that we, we start facing. I mean, after October 7th, because the settlers from the very beginning, their intentions clearly is about taking us out of our land. And that's, they tried the, the millions of ways to, to, to evict us and force us out of here and to leave us with this big amount of fear within ourselves so we can flee, but we yet still in our land and we will not leave 
And yeah, we are living the second Nakba, but we will not be transferred the second time. We will stay over our land and, and continue. And when maybe one of the stories that you saw in the films, the stories I shared about my uncle Suleiman, this great, you know, Palestinian man who who was murdered, you know, uh, by the Israeli police, and he inspired so many people. I am one of them to resist and stand for our rights and continue for, you know, uh, fighting for our our rights. And we lost him, and we still yet get inspired by this man to carry on. Another story I would like to shortly share with you the story of my brother as an example of on the subtlest violence that we live over this area as the movie actually uh, concentrate on individual stories and the individual stories is a very important thing to raise awareness where people touch the the different parts of of someone's life in here you know people hear about this you know there's some call it conflict we call it occupation and yeah, they, they hear about that, uh, the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian suffering, but they don't understand until they hear from individuals and individual stories. This short story that I want to briefly and try to, and this short time to share with you is about my brother, the oldest brother of mine, who was lost actually way before, you know, October 7th, way before we lost my uncle Suleiman. But he still, imagine that he's still among us. <clears throat> I mean, we lost him. In, in 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 you know we we still have the body we lost him way before because one day back in the year of 2000 security guard of the settlement who is a settler attacked him firstly he shot he shot some bullets at him they missed his body my brother ran away back to the community they followed him inside the community that's where we start losing the sense of security and safety in our homes and they took my brother back close to the settlement as he was a shepherd in that day, and he was shepherding close to the settlement fence in our land. And they start beating him all until they, you know, mostly left him dead in the place. And the army helped the settlers to protect them while doing that attack. And they kick us away from that. After they finished, we took my brother to the hospital. The doctors informed us that he lost 80% from his memory and he has severe brain damage. And he will not be able to live as any other, other human being on, on in, in, in this universe and will not have a normal life. And I'm sorry to say, but he is mostly like a, a baby in, in, a, in a body of a grown up man. And after, since we mentioned October 7th, he almost was, you know, was shot and killed by the settlers and the army who, who's just right here living on over our land four times. And yet we still every time scream, shout, film, document, do all of the different things that we can do and we are allowed to do. I mean, and we can see keep our ourselves alive because of this occupation that it doesn't, for him, doesn't matter. Whenever they feel anything, they just shoot, kill anybody or they run, out, run over anybody. And that's the story of my brother. He's still alive in body, but he's lost in brain way before. And that's another story that I, I'm sharing with you now in addition to what I was speaking about in the in this documentary. And yeah, let give me the space here to thank you all, you know, for you know giving me this uh, space to share and also for the CBT to uh, make me participate in this documentary. And yeah, inshallah, it will be a very successful and uh, people around the world watch it because in our life, in our struggle for freedom and rights, Raising awareness is very important thing, and that's what is the community is about. And that's it. And thank you very much. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you so much for uh, sharing more of your story, uh, for sharing your story with us in the film, and also for sharing the story of your brother. I'm really saddened to hear it um but yeah and 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 you the point that you made that this is an occupation and um you know some people call it conflict but this is an occupation and it needs to end um and your stories make a difference and to each one of you all who are here watching as well to remember that 
um, watching films and coming on Zoom calls and listening to stories are part of our each and every one of our engagement in solidarity with with the people of Palestine, and we want to keep sharing those stories. Uh, thank you, Tariq. Uh, next, uh, we have Nizreen, who will be joining us and sharing her story uh, as one of the main characters as well uh, of, the of the film. And, okay, uh, I found this on the web for one of the be... main characters. As... Sorry. Uh, and she will be... Uh, uh, Dania will be translating for Nisreen uh, in today's uh, session. All right, I'll call on Nisreen and Dania. Can you unmute your mics? And uh, Nisreen, you may begin. Seems like we we might have lost Nizreen. Uh, we'll just take a moment to just uh, maybe she'll reconnect here pretty soon. In the meantime, though, uh, if you have questions uh, for the team or for Tarek or Ahmed um, or Tartil or for anyone else, uh, please uh, write them in the chat. Um, or also, um, if you'd like to ask your question, uh, please do so in a succinct way. Um, and uh, we'll open up for Q&A here in, in, in a while. Um, let me just check in with Nisreen again, just to make sure that she's connected. While we wait for Nizreen, I'll just a um, little housekeeping thing about the link that I received a few emails uh, of folks saying that uh, they didn't receive the link or were having trouble. Uh, so I've been able to respond to most, I think you're here because you received the link, uh, but the link that you have to the film will expire tomorrow. And so on Monday, there'll be a new link um, and I can resend that link out if you need more time to watch the film again or, uh, you know, haven't had a chance to watch it or would like to watch it the second time. Uh, I can send that email out to you all uh, on, on Monday. Uh, one of the other things that we'll be including from Monday onwards as well is um, opening up uh, to share the film with communities, uh, to screen it in groups. So if that's something that you might like to do for your community, uh, that, that's an option as well. And you'll find all that information on the website at cpt.org uh, for upcoming screenings. Uh, and um, is there, do we? Right, I think, I think Nizreen is not on the, call i think she must have disconnected she was having some issues with her connection um uh, earlier um so we can we can move into q and a and if nizreen comes in we'll we'll kind of uh, make room for her uh presentation um a little later on so The first question uh, that there, uh, this is a question for the CPT Palestine team. Um, and it is, is there a permanent CPT team in Palestine? Would somebody from the Palestine team like to answer that question and maybe share with us a little bit about what the team does?
Hi everyone, this is Shahd from CBT Palestine. So now we are like uh, mainly Palestinian uh, people, local. We are working now in CBT Palestine and we are opening place for volunteer and um, foreigner volunteer and international to volunteering uh, with us in CBT Palestine. Shad, would you like to share with us a little bit about what um, the work of the team looks like at the moment, uh, considering everything that's going on uh, um, in the West Bank and Gaza? Can you talk a little bit about what the work of the team looks like at the moment? Okay, so the work now is different than before because of the restriction now it's more than before. Uh, for the restricted area in Hebron, sorry, in H2 area, most of the checkpoint is closed. They start opening it in like specific times for uh, schools also and for uh, people who's living inside the restricted area. As people who's living outside the restricted area, we cannot enter the restricted area. So what we do in to monitor uh, the the area and the situation we only can like enter the area in a specific time and uh, go outside the area in a specific time so morning now as there is a school before like after 7th october in a week they start uh, they start to be remotely so online uh, uh, in live classes after that month they start to be like uh, after like before only one month it start to be uh, uh they open again the school in restricted area in uh, in specific dates so they can go as uh, the children they start to go to their schools and uh, in specific dates in uh, in like uh, three days a week so we go there in, in three days and monitoring the situation when they are going to their schools, also when they are coming back from their schools. But we cannot like enter and uh, enter the restricted area and uh, go back from the restricted area in the same time. So we go the turn from um, using the taxi. So we use like 20 minutes from the taxis to reach uh, to the restricted area. And um, and we usually, if we cannot like able to go to the families to visit them, we call them directly. If something happened, we keep calling the uh, families and uh, support them and connect them with the money organization there. So mainly this is our field work. Now the, the settler incursion starts begin again. So, so uh usually there is a slight incursion happened every saturday now we start monitoring again and uh, the settler incursion that happened like in the old city saturdays usually this is mainly what, what we do in field and you can see like uh, our updates in our social media and following us in our mailing list uh, and for sure you can email us if you if you have any any question or any things you would like to share it with us thank you all thank you shad ahmed there's a question for you uh, and it is is there anything you felt you could not capture within the documentary which you would like to draw people attention to Yes, and uh, so the plan, the filming was like many hours, many, many, many hours. We tried to capture everything. We're still missing a lot. And when we did the editing part, we tried to make it more shorter and putting the most important. But one of the most important thing is if you come to Hebron, you will have uh, a nice conversation with a shopkeeper or a family member in Hebron and you will be feel like you are in your in your second home. Uh, this kind of moments of interaction with the communities, with the shopkeepers, with the children, uh, it's make my day. It's what make me continue for three years. Another part which is 
uh, I think the incursion that Shahid mentioned, which is happening every Saturday, we try to we put a small uh, capturing on it on the on the film, but what's happening in reality it's more scary. Uh, they will uh, closing the place. They will intimidating shopkeepers and family. They will only allow settlers to go and putting restrictions on Palestinians, and that's affect the shopkeepers as well. Their uh, their shops will be in a threat and because people they they will be afraid to go and buy stuff from there. And finally, the last part is we would try to put a little bit of a joyful memories and laughter of the CBT members. But uh, in the film, I tried to put it, but I think I, I wasn't successfully uh, putting together. But despite all of the oppression that we are seeing when we are doing the accompaniment or uh, observation, uh, there is a lot of love, a lot of laughter, a lot of smiles happening inside the office, which is, I think that's the, the magic drink that uh, human rights observers drink in order to continue working in, in such a difficult situation and threatful as well. Shukran. Ahmed, while, you, while you're still at it, there's another question for you about whether you have plans to show the film at festivals. Yes, and that's the good news. That's our light for today. Uh, we have successfully applied for many, many festivals, and hopefully we will be selected at least at one. And we will share our news if we were selected uh, with you on our social media with the community. So uh, inshallah, yes, we apply it in different countries, in different festivals, and we will get, uh, inshallah, we will be get selected. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Tariq, I have a question for you. Uh, in this process of uh, telling your story, often I imagine to CPT, team members um, and ex like the experiences that you describe, what is something that grounds you? What is something that gives you hope? It's actually, you know, very hard, you know, question, you know, to answer really, because uh, I'm not sure if we, myself, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but if we still have hope from everything that we see, but I bet still there is you no know, different ways that we try to to keep this, you know, I would say sense of hope within ourselves. When we see the younger generation growing up and them, you know, telling us with, you know, very, I would say, you know, uh, glimpses and their, you know, looks at us as older people and how those people need you know a good a big good and better future that's really is a fuel for ourselves to carry on fighting for our rights and we can i think we can call that a source of hope and that's will definitely tell us that we still have hope even though that i am personally not sure if if that's you know the hope that everyone carries around but yeah, there is million million things around us that they keep reminding us that we shouldn't stop and that we should carry on. And I'm why what why I'm I said that I'm not sure if we lost hope because believe me the situation is way much more than we can imagine. And also you know watching this documentary would tell you part of what the people life is, but you know living the whole life together is a very hard you know, uh, thing to do, believe me. But yeah, I think we still have hope and, you know, to fight for our rights for the, the generations to come and carry on, inshallah, on the same steps. You know, we are carrying on the same steps of our elder people and we will carry on, inshallah, the next generation and the generation after until eventually all of us will receive our rights and receive our freedom.
Thank you so much, Tariq. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, perspective. Um, we have Nizreen is on uh, is here with us, so I'd like to invite her and Dania to uh, unmute their mics and uh, mics and and uh, if you'd like to share Nizreen with us your um, your story and uh, um, what. Ah, there you are. Thank you. Welcome, Nizreen. Welcome, Nizreen. And Dania, can you unmute your mic as well uh, for translation? Yes, hello. Go ahead, Marhaba. Samaini? Uh oh, Samaini. Hello, Sahla Fiko. Shukran, the CBT, and I'm Atun and Majel in no. يعني الناس تتعرف علينا وتعرف قصتنا وكيف بنعيش احنا بالخليل شكرا للجميع um, thank you for CBT and thank you for everyone who's joining us uh, today to hear our stories and um, thank you and welcome everyone ايوه كمل رين العزة وانا فنانه تشكيليه وعندي أربع أولاد وزوجة الشهيد هاشم اللي كان ناشط ضد الجدار والاستيطان. Uh, my name is Nasreen Al Azza and I have four children and uh, my husband was a murdered uh, and his name is Hisham Al Azza and he used to be an advocate against uh, the apartheid wall. And uh, the settlements. Uh, طبعا نحنا يعني في الخليل uh, كل السكان بيعانوا من uh, عنف المستوطنين. في قصص كتيرة ب, ب يعني بتحكي عنهم ونحنا uh, يعني الخليل خاصة uh, وضعها صعب جدا بحيث إنه السكان الفلسطيني بيعيشوا بجنب إلى جنب مع المستوطنين فأكيد في عنف بشكل دائم وفي اعتداءات مستوطنين بشكل دائم على السكان وعلى يعني جميع الناس يعني. Um, I believe that uh, everyone in Hebron is um, affected by the settlements and um, faced violence from settlers and especially Hebron because um, Hebron and settlers living side by side in the same neighborhood in Tel Ermeide and that's why we are in continuous uh, struggle and in continuous attacks by settlers. أكيد أصعب الأشياء اللي إحنا مرينا فيها بذكر تجربتي لما حملت بابني يونس الثاني الأولاد كان في الألفين وثلاثة وكانت المنطقة مغلقة بشكل كامل من لأنه نحن منعيش طبعا بإتشتو اللي هي المنطقة الخاضعة للسيطرة الإسرائيلية وأنا بشكل أنا أصلا بجانب مستوطنة اسمها مستوطنة رمات الشاعر فكان الوضع صعب جدا بالنسبة إلي لما أجيت أولاد ما كانوا يرضوا يخلوني يعني أروح على المستشفى فنزلت سبعة ستة متر عن على طريق عن على كتاف زوجي من الأرض اللي اللي بت يعني اللي بتودي على الشارع الرئيسي لتل الرميدة. Um, like I remember when I uh, was pregnant with my child Eunice in 2003, I was uh, struggling very much because the whole area and the whole neighborhood was under lockdown and uh, there no ambulance could reach out to me and uh, there's no hospital nearby. Um, and the whole, um, uh, the whole area is under the Israeli control in H2. Um, so when I um, when I wanted to give birth to my child, um, I remember my husband carried me on his shoulder for six meters, and um, uh, yeah, he carried me um, off road to reach out the main street. So uh, yeah. 
طبعا أنا لقوني الجنود وسحبوا علينا الأقسام أنا وزوجي سحبوا علينا أقسام الـ الـ يعني المسدسات تعودهم وقالوا لي روحي على البيت ما في إلك تروحي على المستشفى وروحي موتي في بيتك فكانت هذه أصعب تجربة أنا عشتها في الخليل بصراحة صعب الوضع جدا عندنا And I remember uh, the, the soldier point out their guns and uh, told me like, you should not give birth and you should go and die in your house and we won't allow you to pass the checkpoint. And that was the most hideous um, and um, ugliest thing I've ever been through in Hebrew. And it was very hard on me. Uh... ما بعرف يعني عندي أشياء كثيرة يعني بصراحة بتنحكى يعني أكثر شيء كمان عانينا منه اللي هو إغلاق المنطقة في السابع من أكتوبر عن لما صار الهجوم على لما هجموا على غزة فأغلقوا علينا المنطقة بشكل كامل ونحن لحد الآن بنعاني من الإغلاق وأنه ما في إحنا إن أقارب إنهم يجوا يزورونا ما في إلا إحنا نطلع عندهم والمنطقة كانت مغلقة زي ما حكينا بشكل كامل فممكن استمر الإغلاق علينا لأسبوعين كاملين وبعدها فتحونا بشكل جزئي بس لحد الآن ما في أقارب يزورونا يعني ولا حدا بيقدر يتواصل معنا إلا أن احنا ننزل بس على إنه احنا نشوفهم بس um, So after the 7th of October like the whole neighborhood um, um, face a lockdown complete lockdown and no one can get out for two weeks and um, like um, The whole neighborhood was closed and no relatives, no one is allowed to uh, enter our neighborhood. Uh, it's just only the members of the neighborhood can go and get out. And so it's just really hard on us that no one can reach out to us except for us. And the settlers are all over the place. كذلك نحن منعاني لحد الآن من التفتيش المذل. انه واحد واحد يعبر على الحاجز العسكري فتشو اللي بزمر ممنوع يدخل الى المنطقه حتى لو يعني حتى لو هو ساكن في المنطقه ممنوع لازم يشوفوا يستكشفوا ايش اللي بزمر فيه طيب نحن كستات بصراحه عانينا في في ملابسنا مر احيانا اشياء بتزل. يعني ما من... يعني ايش بدهم ايانا عده مرات يقولوا لنا روحوا اخلعوا ملابسكم او ما مش عارفه يعني وين يعني احنا وين بدنا ن... مثلا نغير ملابسنا كنا نطلب من انها تيجي تفتشنا وشيء فهم يقعدوا يتمهزلوا علينا يتمسخروا يقولوا لنا كمان شويه جايه وهم لا هم متصلين فيها ولا شيء يعني انا هذه صارت الحادثه معي ومع ستات كثير فنحن ذلونا بصراحه على الحواجز العسكريه ذلوا طلابنا حتى الطلاب بطلوا يروحوا على المدارس بسبب الإغلاق اللي شامل في المنطقة. Um, so yeah um, after the 7th of October they did um, the body check everyone like every member of uh, the neighborhood who want to enter the neighborhood uh, it goes one by one and they check body everyone and uh, if they like if The, the sound machine of the check like uh, made a sound or peep they had like you had to take off something of your clothes and it was very hard for us like as women like to take off something out of our clothes because this is so hum humiliating and it's so um, like so 
it was very severe on us. And even the students in, uh, in our neighborhood could not reach out to their schools because it was uh, the situation, everything is closed and they are not allowing anyone to enter or go. And they're making everything hard, even for the students uh, of the schools. في كمان أنه في الـ 2015 لما استشهد زوجي فقد حياته بسبب الإغلاق الشارع وبسبب أنه ما في سيارات إسعاف تخدم المنطقة نحن أي واحد بمرض أي واحد بتصيبه نكسة يعني في في صحته أو إشي فمعرض هو حياته للخطر بسبب ما في سيارة إسعاف تخدم المنطقة أو مركز صحي قريب لمنطقتنا هذا كله بال2015 لما أغلقوا علينا المنطقة بسبب عمليات الطعن اللي كانوا يحكوا عنها وفقد كتير من الناس حياتهم بس عشان يعدوا من المنطقة هذه بس يعني بس يعدوا منها ويطلعوا على باب الزاوية كانت الأمور صعبة جدا يعني. And uh, in 2017, it was very hard too because uh, many people lost their lives uh, uh, just going and entering and they just wanted to reach out to Babi Zawiya and they like therefore they had to lose their life and um, and also due to the lockdown and the complete lockdown of the, 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 the road, um, if anyone was sick and if anyone want the ambulance to reach out his house, he could like put his life in danger because the ambulance could not reach out and you have to walk miles and it's a, a long road to walk through and the, the soldier, they make it even harder for you. بالنسبة إحنا كمان بدي أتكلم عن الطريق إحنا ما إنه طريق رئيسية الطريق الرئيسية كلها أغلقت بعد استشهاد هاشم وأصبحنا نيجي على بيوتنا أو بروح أولادي على المدرسة وخاصة يعني خاصة عائلتنا نحن لأنه أنا بتكلم عند عند المستوطنة والطريق اللي عند المستوطنة كله أغلق ليش لأنه إحنا فلسطينيين وممنوع نمرق من هذه الطريق هذه الطريق بس للمستوطنين ممنوع أي حدا فلسطيني يمرق من هذا الطريق فهن احنا اغلقت علينا صرنا نمر من طرق وعرة تخيلي انه 11 سنة انا ابني 11 سنة يحمل جرة غاز يجيبها على بيته يعني يعني هذا ايش بتسموه يعني الطفل باعتبار طفل يحمل جرة غاز ويجيبها على بيته من طرق وعرة طبعا انتم ما رح يتصدقوا الا لما تشوفوا بعينكم ايش المعاناة وإيش كيف الطريق اللي اللي بمر منها ابني و يعني من بيعاني منها وإحنا منعاني منها كمان. Um, and I want to mention that there is no main road to the neighborhood of Tel Ermeda, uh, so they go off road and they had to walk through. Um, the road is is like very hard. And uh, especially to our family, because after um, Hisham was killed, um, they make it even harder for us and that we could not reach, like go through the, the street because it was only for settlers. No Palestinian uh, could walk through it. And uh, you can imagine my child of 11 years old, he had to step up and to be the father of the family because and like now he had to do the father thing because there's no one to take care of the family and he is just only a child and a child should not go through such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> رغم أنهم قطعوا عنا بالانتفاضة الأقصى قطعوا عنا المي قطعوا عنا الكهرباء وأغلقت الطريق وبصير أشياء كثيرة الاعتداءات الجنود لما بيجونا كمان بالليل عشان يفتشوا يفتشوا بيوتنا إيش فيها بيوتنا كل هذا 
ما بزيدنا إلا صمود وأكيد إن إحنا الحمد لله صامدين بفضل الله نحن كمان اللي بيزيد صمودنا زيارات المتضامنين الأجانب لإلنا وللأسف الشديد هي أعمالها بتنقطع زي ما انقطعت في الـ 2016 يعني حياتنا كلها تغيرت بس الحمد لله نحن بعدنا صامدين والصمود كمان بيكون عن طريقي أنا كمان مش إنه بس تتجاهد ولا تصمد وتدافع عن وطنك وعن أرضك بالحجار لا أنا أنا بدافع برضو كمان عن طريق الرسم برسم وبعبر بلوحاتي عن كيف إنه المرأة الفلسطينية صامدة ثابتة إيش بتعمل إيش بتعمل لأولادها نحن مرينا بتجارب كثيره والحمد لله نحن بنجاح الحمد لله um and i want to say that uh, despite all um, the struggle and despite that they cut off our like the water and they cut off the electricity and they um, make our lives harder uh, we are still fighting and we are um, resisting this occupation and no matter what happened we will stay uh, uh, in our houses and we will not um, go away and uh, we will continue fighting and i also uh, as an artist i will continue drawing and painting um, for Palestine because um, we are not leaving this country and we are not leaving uh, Tel Um Yes. <laughs> Shukran للجميع على الاستماع ويعني أي شيء أي أسئلة أنا يعني إن شاء الله. شكرا لكم وإلي. And thank you all uh, for listening to my story and thank you for everyone who attended this uh, meeting and if anyone has any question for me and I'm open for it. Thank you. Nisreen, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to share uh, uh, your story with us. Um, there's a question for you that we received, and we could just start off uh, there. Um, Maggie says, uh, are you still able to paint with all that is going on since October 7th? And how has all that affected your work? نسرين السؤال إليك بعد أحداث 7 أكتوبر لساتك قادرة ترسم وتقاوم وكيف هذا الإشي أثر على شغلك فنانة 7 أكتوبر يعني ما أخفي كل حالة نفسية كانت إلي صعبة جدا بسبب الهجوم على غزة ويعني مناظر الشهداء اللي كنت أشوفها فكثير أثر على نفسيتي وإغلاق المنطقة وما في حدا يعني بصراحة يدعمني من, من المتضامنين اللي كانوا يجوا عنا أو يقطفوا حتى الزيتون تاعنا كل هذا فقدته فقدت شغلي ما أخفيكم الوضع كان صعب علينا ما كان حدا متحضر ل 7 أكتوبر لذلك المنطقة اللي إحنا شوف يعني الحياة اللي إحنا شفناها في 7 أكتوبر كانت صعبة جدا للغاية علينا وما زلنا بنعاني من من الأشياء اللي اللي صارت يعني مش بس أهل غزة إحنا كمان بنعاني بالضفة. Uh, I wanna say that uh, it affected my work that I stopped working I lost my like I didn't know what to do because there were uh, no support no solidarity in my neighborhood not even um, 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 because all the uh, lockdown and all the um, the thing that we see we've we've all seen in Gaza uh, it was very uh, hard uh, on my mental health and psychologically I could not like paint or do anything because it was very hard on my uh, health. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
can you just kind of a continuation of that same question, Nizreen? Uh, has the how has the occupation influenced your art? كيف أثر الوضع على رسمك والفن؟ بالنسبة لرسمي أنا بت يعني بتمنى بعد اللي شفته أنا من ال من اللي صار بغزة وإيش صار ل ل يعني لأهل غزة بصراحة هذا زادني يعني العاطفة يعني يعني صارت عندي عاطفة قوية إني أنا أرسم عن المشاهد الدمار وعن مشاهد الأبرياء اللي راحوا لكن إن شاء الله يعني في أفكار جديدة مني أنا بدي أعملها بس النفسية لحد الآن أنا النفسية صعبة جدا من اللي شفته فيعني بتمنى الله إنه يصير رسمي أحسن و... وإني أرسم عن أشياء مش عن أشياء هذه المآسي اللي بتصير في غزة إن شاء الله um, It uh, motivated me to, um, to continue my art and to continue my work but even though the uh, situation was very hard on me to uh, do uh, new ideas and um, because the scenes and it was very hard even to see, not alone to paint or draw something out of them. Um, but I hope one day, um, one day I just paint and draw something that is not very tragic and that is not very sad and to draw something very beautiful and not just about uh, tragic scenes. Thank you. Thank you, Nizri. Um, Ahmed, there's a question for you. Uh, there's a scene in the film where it seems like you have your camera hidden as you go through checkpoints. Uh, can you tell us more about what it was like to film that? Uh, and someone asked, did you have trouble with Israeli authorities during the filming? Uh, so it was separated events. So uh, when we did a component to a school students and try to film it, to put it on a documentary, it was, I don't know how to describe it. I, like I was going to hell with my own feet because I didn't know if they, if they discovered the GoPro that I'm hiding it inside my hand because I was putting putting it uh, on my hand and every time when they are not really focusing with me focusing with my colleagues I try to uh, film it in the opposite way and I still I cannot imagine if they dis if they discover it what will happen to me totally I don't know where I got the courage to do it but uh, we try as much as possible to bring uh, the reality that we are seeing every day into other film that you can see, even if you are not access or you are not able to come to Palestine or to Hebron, those kind of clips and events were was able, hopefully, to show a little bit of what's going on. On the second question, when we before we interviewing Nisreen, the plan was to uh, interviewing her in her, inside her house. And before a couple of days ago, we went to Talermede, to her neighborhood, in order to film and take a glimpse, uh, take a videos and shots. And suddenly, settlers uh, stopped us with his big gun and detained me and my colleague, a foreigner uh, volunteer, for approximately one hour and a half. Uh, I will share also the link of the article that uh, we wrote, me and my uh, Italian friend that we were today together uh, to this article. So uh, yeah, we try to hide it like it's a full story. Uh, I really encourage you to read it and see what's going on. And that's a small piece of what the Palestinian going through. 
थैंक यू थैंक यू अहमद वी हैव a few minutes more and uh i just wanted to see if there were any other questions uh from from the audience uh tonight if they don't have i have one question for the team if they allow me go ahead ahmed go ahead okay so i know that the team was really really patient with me so i really appreciate it i appreciate all of the patience that you have in order to make this film so uh my question for the team is what is your favorite part of the film or uh when we are filming uh the event and before you answering the question i also i would like to thank our bc uh, mona zuhairi she was one of the big supportive for us uh, since the idea was initiated until the final stage so a uh, big thanks for her big thanks for her encourage and support and love that provided for the team and for caldwell as well uh, for doing all of the support and all of the website and editing and stuff so uh, i hope that the team have now time a little bit to think about it So uh, please let me know which one is ready to answer. What is your favorite part, even or in the film or while we are um, filming? Okay, I'm ready to answer. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Amira and I'm part of CPT team. And answering Ahmed's question, I I think my favorite part. I don't have favorite because the whole documentary is the favorite, but um, while we were filming Nisreen and uh, while she was talking about her story, because I'm an artist like Nisreen, so I can understand the feelings. So hearing from Nisreen, it was something so emotional and just took my heart. So uh, yeah, I would say that Mr. Insbart, it's my favorite. And also working with Ahmed during the filming uh, because he's always have a plan. And <laughs> I'm the one who's just play with Ahmed's plan. So we have a lot of fun behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, I think this moment, it's also my favorite. I'm ready to talk. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Baha. I'm from Hebron. I joined CBT since two years almost. Um, my favorite moment is uh, the team meeting. It was like uh, um, funny, but it's formal. <laughs> And also, when we went to South Hebron Hills, it uh, was uh, when Ahmed asked us like to film it like To repeat it many times, like <laughs> it was also funny, yeah. and every mo every mo moment uh, in the film, it was favorite, my favorite. Thank you. Check. Hi everyone, again this is Shad. Like I think the whole film is my favorite. I usually like since we finished the film and we did the translation. Uh, when I have time or a break, I usually open the film and I start watch it. And usually I watch like I repeat the the end part, watching the laughing part, and still remind me. Still after the whole situation, we were all of us during filming. Sometimes we repeated as the Baha said, we repeat repeated the likes the the film or the section a lot. So. So we were so tired. So in the end, we still have time to to laugh, and all of us we were laughing, sometimes without no reason. So we still it's remind us with us as Palestinian, and we still have time to laugh, to enjoy life, to because we deserve this life. We de deserve love. We deserve peace. 
and hoop. So, so this is why usually I repeat this section. Uh, a lot of stories inside the film, it's sad, but in the end, it's remind us, you know, we still have this resilience and we still resist as us as Palestinian. So thank you, Ahmad, for this question. Mona, do you have, uh, do you want to share as well? Uh, I would like to share that um, I love every single part. I was proud to see the work of the team, the love and the effort you put into it, um, and the dedication I see in each one of you. Um, and I love each one of you more than anything else, more than the... I love everything you work on, light and other things. We love you more, Mona. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. For, thank you, team, for sharing your favorite parts of the film. I'm sure it was quite the process, and it was a joy for me as well to uh, participate in this process with, uh, with all of you. Um, thank you for your hard work. Um, just there's one question um, about subtitles in the film uh, in in the version of the film that will be coming up on Monday uh, with the new link will have subtitles for the shorter for the shorter version as well um, and then there's a last question that we have over here Ahmed back to you again how did you decide which stories to put in the film uh, I didn't decide it we, the team, decided we were uh, thinking about different stories and we were coming up with different people. There was a lot of suggestion, unfortunately. There was a lot of suffering from people, uh, but it's uh, a team decision of which one that we want to work with, uh, or at least to highlight in this film. Uh, yeah. So, but it was kind of a balance between uh, two areas, two gender uh two different stories two different things but at the end we we find out that it's the same being the same source of oppression which is occupation and i would like to highlight again what Tarek said it's not a conflict it is occupation it is apartheid and what's happening in gaza it is a genocide so uh Sorry, Kaldwell, but I need to take a moment to take action, to ask for action. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would like to ask for everyone here is to start using the right words because it mean different meaning. When we say conflict, it gives people a different perception. When we are saying occupation, uh, there is a lot of going on. So please start using the right terminology, occupation, not conflict, because as a Palestinian and other Palestinians, this word conflict, it's triggering us. Uh, it's apartheid. And in addition to this, if you have noticed in the film, the occupation are also using the AI. They are using the automatic guns to, to suppress and oppress us. We have witnessed, if you, uh, in the film, we have witnessed people got injured by electronic machine at Babi Zawiya checkpoint. Uh, so again, thank you for everyone for coming here, for watching. I will give it to you, Kadwell, as well, the mic back. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate it. I appreciate uh, Tara and Nisreen for uh, giving us the time and effort for filming with them, giving us the space and allowing us to get into their pain, to their story, and opening up, not just for us, for everyone. So it is difficult, it is harsh, but it's it's really meaningful for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're kind of wrapping up uh, now. There's one question about the new link to the uh, to the film. I I send an email to everyone, and I if you 
receive that email, please respond. Just reply to it uh, for the new link, and and then I'll I'll get you the link. If you did not get the email, you can send me an email at communications at cpt.org, and I can send you uh, the link uh, to uh, to the to the new link. Uh, but just before we go, we would like to invite you to consider things that you can do. Uh, one and foremost is to support um, the end of the occupation, to stand in solidarity with Palestinians resisting and fighting for their liberation um, and getting to know the situation yourself. So one thing that you can do is join a CPT delegation that we have uh, to Palestine from November 7th to 17th. Uh, the link is in the chat and you can find uh, all the information there. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn and to see uh, CPT's work of nonviolence on the ground and to connect with CPT's partners uh, and see the reality of of, of the occupation yourself. Um, the other thing that you can do is screen this documentary with your community. Uh, on Monday, we'll have more information about screening the documentary with your community on the website, on cpt.org. And um, um, I think it'll be a great opportunity for others to also kind of hear the stories uh, that you've seen today in this in this webinar. We'll be sharing this webinar as well on YouTube and we'll share uh, send the links to you as well for that. And the last request that we have, if you, you or your community are interested in hearing more about what is happening in Palestine, uh, you can request somebody from the Palestine team uh, to do an online webinar, uh, talk, preach a sermon to your community and uh, you'll find um, a link here as well to invite speakers. Um, it's it's one of the most, I think, uh, wonderful ways to connect more intimately with a CPT uh, team member and to learn about the work uh, uh, firsthand. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for supporting this work. Thank you so much for um, your commitment to peace and justice as well. Uh, please um, have a good day or a good evening and uh, enjoy the film again if you want to watch it again. Uh, and thank you to the team, to Mona and to everyone for all the work that you've done. Thank you all. Thank you, Caldwell. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.